Murder and Such contains stories about murders, the macabre, true crime, serial killers, and other dark subject matter. This includes adult themes, language, descriptions of gore, violence, and other information provided by news articles, witness testimony, and public record. Murder and Such is not intended for all audiences, and all their warnings will be set in place. Listener discretion is still advised. Last Friday, I sat in a courtroom to support a friend. For the better part of a decade, our professional and personal lives were woven into a relationship akin to family. As if family, the intention of my attendance was to publicly acknowledge the deep care and compassion I hold for this individual. I watched as she searched for the strength to behold her transgressor for the first time in over a year since learning about the plot to have her murdered. I listened to her describe the love that she once possessed for this man whom she adored, trusted, and depended on as her husband. I followed along as she detailed his abandonment of her and her children, a betrayal he failed to own but opted to blame on a lost sense of morality. This excuse became further excused by a defense that drug abuse had clouded his judgment. She attempted to rebuild a life with three young children apart from a man who viewed them as disposable. The strength and resilience of these children, whom she saved from abandonment, poverty, and certain early death, were being further challenged by his domestic unraveling. Her desire was to give them love and stability. His response was to have her executed. I observed his defense, acknowledged the crime, but defend it once again with the argument that steroids created mental instability. I followed as the prosecution reminded the court of an intricately calculated series of actions occurring over the course of many weeks. A scheme which involved using her children to secure gate codes for a would-be assassin and his plans for their further exploitation as an alibi, a plot indicative of careful premeditation over momentary mindlessness. I watched as a judge highlighted how many men use steroids but do not plot to murder innocent women, and for someone to move towards such action reveals something twisted within their character. He continued to point out that a willingness to involve children in such matters is deeply disturbing and reprehensible as well. The accounts I interpreted within this courtroom were details of people and a past that I had known and observed firsthand. All and everything was as I knew it to be. I share this in response to an interview between Tim Lambesis and Ryan J. Downey that was released on altpress.com moments after this woman and her family were given their closure. Behind the facade of a penitent man with a renewed outlook, restored faith, and apparent remorse is a fairly appalling agenda to further damage the lives and reputations of his non-supporters. It is the continued defense of behavior that leveled every facet of an innocent woman's being and traumatized children who have already persevered through this actual pain of an orphan's life. There is no contrition in his pseudo-physiological jargon, and the verbalized assessment of his relationship with myself and former bandmates is absolute slander. I had spoken with him directly and in length of how 100% of my heart, love, and loyalty was being directed in support towards his victims. These victims being people I had opened my heart to as family for many years and whom I pray will find healing from his deep abuse. In a complete disregard for the truth, as I'm certain he understands it, he opted to fabricate motives that describe us abandoning him as a callous business decision. The intent of his defamation is to create an air of sympathy and support under false pretense of a forthcoming tell-all. Unfortunately, this has worked to a degree, as many strangers have put effort into projecting hatred towards those of us who chose to defend the guiltless subjects of his crimes. It is regrettable that he utilized this platform as means to justify his conduct. The prosecution of this case profiled him as a sociopathic narcissist in definite need of rehabilitation. For those of us who truly know the man for who he is, 
it's shameful that in spite of all he is, is still as he ever was, and just as they say. For Jordan, Phil, Josh, and myself, we'll continue to carry on knowing we behaved honorably, lovingly, and loyally to the individuals who truly needed it. That was published May 19th, 2014 to Nick Hippa's personal Facebook page. Aside for the small updates they had given, considering in part one how I discussed how there was an anonymous post to the official As I Lay Dying's website, this was truly Nick's words to finally cut deep into Tim, let everybody know how he felt, and finally wash his hands of the situation. I felt for him when I read this. How could a brother do such a thing? Even with the bands that I've been in, it's almost like when a bandmate gets a significant other, that said person is almost indoctrinated like family. I can't say the same for Yoko Ono with the Beatles, but Megan had been a part of his extended family for many years and was like a sister to Nick and the rest of the band. But no, Tim had gone so far off the deep end that he wanted to make her pay the ultimate price and be murdered. So he got exactly what he deserved. The metal community also almost unanimously felt like Tim was given what he deserved, or even more. He lost his band, he lost his kids, he lost his wife, and he, more than anything, lost his freedom. It seemed, at the very least, a price to pay, even if to some it felt like it was not enough. Now, speaking of his ominous post on the website, Tim was right. The band had reformed as a different group. It still had Josh, Nick, Jordan, and Phil, along with, as Tim mentioned, Shane Blay from the Fort Worth, Texas band O Sleeper. After the band had decided to put As I Lay Dying on an indefinite hiatus, the band formed again as an alternative metal band called Woven War in 2013. The outfit is still classified as a working band, but Phil Scrasso, who was the rhythm guitarist, had decided to quit the band in 2016 for some unforeseen reasons. The band themselves were also signed to the same label, which was Metal Blade, which made an easy transition on them, considering that Metal Blade was the same label that As I Lay Dying was on. Their debuted self-titled album was released later on August 5th of 2014 and peaked at the number 36 spot on the U.S. Billboard Top 200, which was a little jarring considering the band had reached higher peaks with As I Lay Dying. But overall, the band's music wasn't bad, but it was nowhere near the intensity that they were used to playing. They had even toured with the likes of Black Label Society, Periphery, and All That Remains. But their second album, Honor Is Dead, was released on October 21st of 2016, but received even less recognition as many people in the metal genre were just seeing it as a remnant of something that As I Lay Dying used to be. It wasn't the same. It was almost like it was kind of a different sound. It was less intense, less in your face, no mentions of any religious connotations within the lyrical content. And honestly, this is just my opinion, but I just kind of didn't really care for it. But shortly after Your Honor is Dead is when Phil left the band. You could tell that even though they were touring, playing music, and hitting the streets like they did so many times before, something just wasn't the same. Now I'm going to do a little bit of quick housekeeping. We do have a new patron that joined the Patreon page since the last episode, and thank you for listening to the last episode, by the way. But I want to give a special thank you to Haley Porter for jumping on the Patreon and uh, being generous with her donation. If you would like to join the Patreon, you can visit patreon.com backslash murder and such, and you can join for just $1 an episode, and it's only charging two episodes per month. I have a couple new ones lined up for you that will, uh, hopefully I can fill November with a lot more stuff. I'm not making any promises. And to people who are curious why this one came out on Sunday, Sunday was, is, is, it's kind of my Sunday nights at 10 p.m. Every other Sunday is when I put out an episode. The reason why it went live on a Friday was because I actually spent the weekend in Iowa hanging out with some friends, and I was there from Friday until uh, Monday. So that's why it came out a little bit early, and you had to wait just a couple days longer. So this is 
part two of Tim Lambesis. Now, with Nick, he continued to be an outspoken member of As I Lay Dying. Tim had tried reaching out to him, considering he didn't have a no-contact order set in place against Nick, but most of Tim's words and attempts had fallen on deaf ears. Nick would talk in later interviews how this man would not be a brother anymore and a shadow of his former self. You have to imagine for a second, not only has one of your best friends and brother tried to kill his wife, but his actions had also led to your very own livelihood being stripped away from you. The band that he helped build for over a decade was now gone, and the attempts at music that he was making after that weren't proving to be as successful. Sure, Woven War had some very real fans, garnered some very real attention, and was musically still sophisticated enough to where you could hear Nick speak through his guitar playing, but it wasn't as big as As I Lay Dying. It honestly wasn't even close. So this selfish fuck had taken away friends, family, and food out of your mouth, clothes off your back, and the one thing that most people knew Nick from. It's said that every action has an equal or opposite reaction, but due to Tim's lapse in judgment, attempted murder, and selfishness, he completely fucked his marriage, his wife, his family, and his friends. Just remember that as the story continues. Now, I did want to back up a bit and discuss the alternative press interview with Tim. The article was published on May 16th of 2014, the same day that Tim was sentenced to six years in prison, and the interview was conducted by Ryan J. Downey. The interview starts off mainly talking about Tim and Megan's decision to adopt children as opposed to having children of their own. And Tim had stated that when he was in high school, he would go with his church group to do missionary work down in Mexico or other low-income, impoverished areas. When he was there, he met a child named Edgar, who he thought was between the ages of 9 and 10, and how this kid had never felt the love and compassion that Tim and his fellowship had shown him, like I had mentioned back in part one of the series. So that's when he and his now former wife had decided to adopt rather than conceive their own children. He said that he wanted to show children love and compassion that they wouldn't be able to have in their current situation, and Megan had decided to do most of the paperwork and get the ball rolling on most everything. That led them to adopt their first child, being only 15 months old, of an eventual three children when everything was said and done. The next topic that they touched on is Megan filing for divorce. This part kind of pissed me off a little bit, and I can understand where Nick was coming from when he said that he wanted to make that statement in regards to Tim's interview. I honestly completely backed that. I'm definitely no relationship counselor and probably the last person you should go to for relationship advice, but Tim almost started blaming Megan for feeling lost and abandoned when she filed the paperwork. As Tim stated, he thought she was almost having an identity crisis being a mother of three kids, staying at home, and taking care of them while Tim was out and about writing music, touring, working out, etc. And he felt like the adoration that he wasn't getting from his wife, he could get from his fan base. And that justified him to the point where he was constantly working out. Now, I don't fault him for saying this particular part, but he talked about his physique and how he wanted to be the top performer he could be, so he started nitpicking at his own body, which started spiraling insecurities about himself. Then Ryan started hitting him with questions about his steroid usage. As Tim had stated, he had hit a physical plateau, but he wanted to grow more. He speaks about how everyone is on steroids, from muscle magazines to dudes who look like Brad Pitt's character from Fight Club, so he figured he would just be honest with himself and start taking them just like everybody else. They even talked about how the balance of testosterone-based hormones that he was on had eventually led him to have a very unbalanced hormonal system, and, before he was arrested, he said that the testosterone level that he had was lower than that of a 90-year-old man. When he was arrested, he was obviously taken off the steroids, and his testosterone had fallen to a rock bottom level, but his estrogen was matching an all-time high. He wasn't too thrilled about that, and keep that in the back of your mind as the story continues. Then Ryan asked him about roid rage. 
Tim had thought that it was just a myth, and the guy who was giving him the information had stated that only 10 to 20 percent of people who take steroids have an adverse reaction to them. Tim, of course, didn't think of himself as someone who would be affected and wasn't a part of the minority. Well, we all know how that turned out for him. So he continued to take them, abuse them, and as he stated, quote, there are a lot of things I did after 2012 that I would never picture myself doing now. The way I acted, the way I reacted, my priorities, end quote. After that came his faith, or I should say, his lack thereof. Tim spoke about his major in philosophy back in college, and how his mindset had adopted over time because he found Christianity harder to defend as time went on. He talked about his first time he cheated on his wife, and how he would manipulate his own thought process only to serve himself and to make his actions justifiable. That was something that I learned from this interview that Nick also stated. There was no acceptance from his actions. The piece came out the same day that he was sentenced. In a sense, it was almost clickbait considering the timing. As the conversation passes over the faith part, it almost seemed like Ryan was starting to throw him softballs. At this point in Tim's life, he had been off the steroids for a while now and was still a massive dude, so I can't say if it was uh, fear or intimidation, but some of the questions and statements from Ryan left a very sour taste in my mouth. Ryan then asked him about his time at the gym and how he spent almost too much time there. Now, Tim had stated that he owned up to that and that he only had spent about an hour at the gym at most. Ryan then said, quote, a lot of fathers play golf or go sit in a bar. I'd say that hour was better, at least, end quote. That's, a, that's seriously a fucking softball question. Now, Tim did admit that after reflection, he wished he would spend that time with his kids instead, so at least I guess that's somewhat of a good admission on his part. I don't know. They later went on to discuss how they still claim to be in the Christian metalcore scene to sell more albums, sell more tickets, and it stated that he was probably the second or third person to give up Christianity in the band. He stated that in the 12 years of touring with, quote, Christian metal bands, there was only about 10 of them that truly still believed that they were still Christian and that it was all a ploy to garner more sales and have their albums sell more based on the facade of Christian views. I will admit that back in the day, I was a Christian. Today, I'm not. Atheism and the severance of Christianity has increased over the last century. According to a Gallup polling effort done between 1944 until 2016, there are more atheists and people who do not believe in God in America than there has ever been before. In the Gallup poll, they had asked, quote, Do you believe in God? And in 1944, only 1% of the correspondents had said no. That number has only grown over time, and by its highest peak in 2014 and 2013, an estimated 11% of respondents had answered no. This is something that has been on a growing trend throughout history. It's nowhere near the country of Uruguay, which reported that in 2010, 24% of the general population was atheist. But I'm not here to teach you about my beliefs, tell you how to repent or praise the deity that you believe in. But the fact that Tim was using this as a ploy to get more money says a lot about himself, and honestly, his bandmates as well. Everyone wants to find success, and some will find it using any means necessary. I'm glad that he talked about that, and that even Nick talked about it as well. I'd rather go out being honest than remembered for being a liar. But Tim even played the part of a Christian as well. After Ryan asked him, quote, what happened when a kid asked to pray with you? Tim stated, quote, I remember playing one Christian festival where an interviewer wanted one of the guys to share his testimony, and he just froze up and let one of the guys who was still Christian at the time answer the question. We laughed about it afterwards, but we were only laughing because it was so awkward. When kids would want to pray with us after shows, I'd be like, um, go ahead and pray. And I would just let them pray. I'd say, amen. If praying while having my hand on their shoulder makes them feel better, I didn't want to take that away from them. When they would specifically ask me to pray for something, I'd say, I don't really like to pray out loud. I'll take that with me to the bus. End quote. He later admitted that it was a cowardly act, and I do agree with that. 
These are the people who your words mean everything to. They spend their hard-earned money grabbing albums, taking time off work or school to come see you play. I mean, fuck, I even spent money to see his ass live as well. Even though, you know, I wasn't a Christian at the time and didn't care. But for the people who did believe in something that they thought that he also believed in, it was most definitely a selfish and cowardly act and almost a slap in the face on his part. The guilt would be insurmountable for me if I were in his position. Hell, even being in his position with the notoriety, the music, and doing one of my dream jobs, he was killing it, but he couldn't even have the common decency to tell his fans that he was lying to them unless he left the answers ominously in the booklet that comes with the album. The last statement in the interview from Ryan was, quote, Most guys think their band will be popular forever. Tim then replied, I went to Megan at one point and said, I have saved up a good chunk of money. We can get a house, and then there's not much more money that I will need in order for us to live comfortably. The big pressure was always on me to tour less. We were finally in that position. I gave her a budget of $500,000 to pick out a house. We pay for the entire thing at once, and she'd never have a house payment. She couldn't find a house that she liked for that amount of money. She found one for $750,000. I said, you know that means I'm going to have to tour a lot more for this to happen. You want me to be home more often. Now she is saying, I want the $750,000 house. You're going to have to tour more often. That's when I realized we had both changed so much in different ways. She couldn't look at me as the same person she married. I couldn't even look at her that way. We could have easily gone to counseling for that. But I didn't even push the issue. I was like... This is the final straw. I kind of gave up on us ever being the, on the same page ever again. She's a pretty reasonable person. If I had given her a hard time about it for a week or two, she could have probably agreed to compromise. But I just didn't care anymore. End quote. Again, this selfish shit passed the blame. Nick had every right to be mad at Tim for this interview, and I don't know how his mental state was at the time, but he was definitely, it, it was the last fucking straw for him. I didn't care about him anymore, and I didn't think he was worthy of the lifestyle that he once had. He had everything. A wife, kids, house, band, touring, fame, every single fucking thing he ever wanted. A self-made American dream of sorts. And he pissed it all away for what? What was the reason? Because he felt like he and his wife had drifted apart, that she needed to be killed? Where's the justification in that? Because honestly, I don't see it. So, as I stated, six years of a possible nine was his sentence. Luckily, Megan wasn't killed, and he was behind bars, where he had no contact, and he couldn't speak to her or her children. They were safe. That's what they needed at most. As I stated, the rest of the band was playing in Woven War. They kept touring, making music, and didn't really talk much about Tim or how they felt about the situation surrounding him. Tim had filed for a reduced sentence with the hearing on July 18th of 2014, stating that his time on house arrest could count as credit towards his sentence as time served, but that was struck down at the hearing because, as they stated, the ankle monitor that he was wearing was not actually a condition of bail, so technically, he wasn't on house arrest, and they still upheld the six years behind bars. Now, while Tim was in prison, he filed a lawsuit against the prison medical staff for $35.5 million. I purposely omitted this from the Associated Press interview just because I want to talk about it right here. So when Tim was in jail, I stated that he had a very low testosterone level. The thing about anabolic steroids affecting your body is that when you have an increase in testosterone, it also increases your estrogen as well. Your body naturally will try to create one to balance out against the other. Well, Tim had filed a lawsuit against Mary Abiaro and others for not prescribing him anastrozole which was first prescribed to him when he was first incarcerated to help counter the estrogen levels in his body, considering he wasn't on the steroids anymore. Now the thing about a heightened level of estrogen, if you remember the movie Fight Club, let's just throw out the name Robert Paulson, otherwise known 
as Bob. What was Bob known for in Fight Club? Bob had gynecomastia, or as in the movie, and Tim referred to it as bitch tits. Tim was going through a phase where his once stacked pectoral muscles started developing into softened breasts, which was mentally anguishing for him. The staff had stated that they were going to continue with the drugs for him, but they didn't give a specific date. Now, Nick had even talked about his lawsuit in a later interview stating that, quote, It's sad to see somebody that we spent so much of our lives with end up in such a place. He could have made such a great impact on this world, but he just gave in to the worst parts of himself. Even more discouraging for me is the fact that he's trying to file a lawsuit for that amount. It says to me that he's still the same sort of personality at his core. Nothing has changed. He thinks of himself in a certain way, and he thinks of himself in a situation he created as the victim." End quote. Which I agree with Nick. If that's the biggest concern that he had about being in prison, I feel like he hasn't changed. Maybe it's the cynic in me, but I didn't care that he was growing a pair of man boobs. I just cared that society was safe from him. Now as time went on, Woven War continued making music, releasing albums, and touring doing what those guys love the most. Then Tim started reaching out later after he started his sentence and found himself talking to Jordan every once in a while. You have to imagine that Jordan and Tim knew each other longer than they knew any of the other members of the band. Tim and Jordan founded As I Lay Dying, and Jordan was still an apparent active member after the remainder of the band members renounced their roles within the group. But it wasn't something that he wanted to share with the rest of the members. He kept this pretty close to his chest and kept in contact with Tim as his prison sentence continued. Maybe he saw someone different, somebody changing. Maybe the brother that he used to know was still in there somewhere. But that was for him to decide and not the rest of us. Now, I do want to go on a bit of a tangent. Yes, I may have been a little biased, and I'm not there to persuade you. I'm, I'm only giving you the facts and sprinkling my opinions here and there as I've always done. But I will always leave it up to you to decide your feelings, because no matter what I say, I can't deny your thoughts, opinions, and feelings about a certain person, let alone topic. You know... Actually, here's a little story that I kind of wanted to talk about. I was recently approached by a person who dealt with a lot of trauma in her life. Just as many years of trauma as I've been alive. She is a victim of abuse. Emotional, mental, and physical. The trifecta of abuse that nobody deserves. She kept saying something to me that I kept on picking up on. When we were talking, she would say things such as, You're going to think I'm crazy, or I know this is going to sound stupid. Essentially, being dismissive of her thoughts and her opinions. That really kind of hurts, because she was almost prefacing her statements like that. In my opinion, why would talking about your thoughts, feelings, emotions, and opinions be stupid? Granted, yeah, there are some stupid fucking opinions out there, like people who think the earth is flat, but that's a different topic for a different day. But I think that some compassion is lost amongst us these days. She had been abused, gaslighted, verbally and mentally beaten so badly to the point where she thought that even talking about such things to an almost stranger would make them think that she was crazy or stupid. How is that even a thing? How does someone who's a complete narcissist have the ability to persuade someone into questioning their very own feelings? If you were to stand at the edge of a cliff, look down, and feel your stomach rise into your fucking throat, how would you feel about someone telling you that you're stupid or crazy for having that kind of a reaction? It doesn't make sense to me. So... I told her something. I told her, quote, Why would I think that you're crazy? Nobody has the right to tell you whether they hurt you or not. 
That's something that you feel. Your feelings are valid, and they will always be valid. Now, I personally think that this is true, and I live by that code. Granted, some opinions about topics are eligible for debate, like politics and whatnot. But the feeling that you get when someone is trying to manipulate you, lying to you, and trying to control you, they hold gravity and weight. That's something that therapy has taught me. Being in tune with your thoughts and feelings isn't just a good thing, it's a responsible thing. Only you can know who you truly are and you're capable of change and progress. The day that we stop denying our feelings, denying our thoughts, and stop growing as humans is the day that we let stagnancy win and we stop evolving. Have a conversation with yourself. Set some goals and plans for yourself. Call a loved one, listen to a friend, try to help. That's the compassion that we can have for each other, and that is what makes a sense of friendship and community. No one is going to be better by constant finger pointing and blaming. I'm pretty sure that anyone who's listening to this would have rather be remembered for their love and compassion rather than their indifference and close-mindedness. But I also want to thank those of you who reached out to me after part one of this series and thank me for putting in the part about domestic violence and mentioning how you can find help by visiting thehotline.org or calling the number 1-800-799-7233 for help and assistance because nobody should live their life in fear of somebody else. Nobody should be controlled by something else and as the old time proverb says, no reason to stay is the best reason to go. You're worth it. And I truly mean that. If you find yourself in a moment of fear or terror, don't forget that you can also call 911 for further assistance. And even you can text 911 in many areas to get a quieter response if you can't make a phone call. So thank you again. I truly love and appreciate you guys. So getting back into it, I think that people are capable of change. Kind of running along with being in tune with yourself, having conversations with yourself about life, your current status, where you are, and where you want to be, I think that people can self-reflect and change if they want to. But it's no easy task. I was tired of being angry, irritated, pushy, and the piece of shit that I was before getting mental health treatment, and I'm not the only one. It took the help of my sister and a dear friend of mine to convince myself that I don't have to live like that forever. Now, I'm more in tune with myself and very well on a path that I would rather be on than where I was a year ago. People can help, people can show care, and people most definitely can change but how can we apply that to this story? Well, Tim went almost radio silent when it came to his fans and critics. He was in jail all the way until December 17th of 2016. Tim had been released early and sentenced to one year of probation, but the outside world was not ready for him. He hadn't even been imprisoned for three full years at this point. And judging by his interview with the alternative press, it didn't seem like he was about to admit his faults, admit his downfalls, and atone for his transgressions not only against his bandmates, but his wife and children as well. From what I could remember, nobody was really happy about his release from jail. Most comments I saw from my personal favorite metal website, the PRP, most people were either poking fun at him for his male breasts, or they thought he was just going to end up back in prison for going turbo roid rage on people. My personal feelings though? I wasn't happy about it. He should have been let out after the six years. I hadn't heard anything about him and honestly he flew under my radar and he was closer to a grave than anything for me. The band wasn't speaking about it, he wasn't speaking about it, and most definitely Megan was not speaking about his early release. 
He had the year where he had to check in with an officer as a part of his parole, but other than that, he was a free man and free to walk the streets as he did four years prior. But then... Ugh, something happened. On June 19th, 2017, a post was made to Tim and the band's Facebook and Twitter accounts. All it read was, quote, activity. Rather ominous, but that's how it was intended. Considering the bandmates didn't use the official forums for the band, it was definitely Tim who posted it. When I read that, I was like, yeah, right, fuckface. Keep your mouth shut, because you should still be in jail right now. But that wasn't everything. On September 2nd of 2017, a person who was familiar with the situation had stated that Tim was planning on trying to resurrect As I Lay Dying with a set of new members, since his relationship with many of the former band members had become strained from his atrocities. When I heard about that, I was... I, honestly, I, I scoffed at the idea. There is no Azalee dying without Nick, Phil, Josh, and Jordan. I mean, Jordan still has a stake in the band being one of the original members, so I hadn't heard if he was going to be a part of this or not, but the rest of the guys? Sorry, but only Nick can play guitar like Nick does. Only Josh can do the backing vocals like Josh. And honestly, it looked like a piss poor attempt at a cash grab for Tim. I hadn't heard anything personally from him in months after his release except for just trying to work on what he was known for and not who he was or who he had become. Now, one thing that I found was fucking hilarious was two days after the report of Tim trying to resurrect As I Lay Dying was that the vocalist from a band named Archspire, named Oliver Aileron, had started up a GoFundMe to fight Tim Lambesis. I found this fucking golden because the funding goal was only for $2,000, and it stated, quote, This asshole tried to have his wife murdered. I'm a small dude, and I'm not very good at fighting, but Tim is very large and strong. I think he sucks for trying to kill his wife, but also, I need to train to get bigger so I can kick his stupid ass for being a piece of shit. Help me fight him. Help spread the word." End quote. That was golden. I loved every second of that thing. I hadn't really heard of Archspire, but goddammit, did I want to see this dude enter a stage with Tim and see Tim get his teeth kicked down his throat? Many, many outspoken bands had given their stance about his release, mostly condemning Tim for the fact that he was on the outside with the rest of us. But then something happened that I didn't expect. On December 17th of 2017, one full year after his release, the official As I Lay Dying social media pages all posted the same thing. Of course, it was Tim but here is what it said. Quote, Words cannot begin to express how deeply sorry I am for the hurt that I have caused. There is no defense for what I did, and I look back on the person I became with much disdain, as many of you likely do. First, I apologize to my former wife and remarkable children for my appalling actions. There's not a single day that goes by where I don't wish I could undo the damage I caused, and out of respect for their wishes, I will not discuss anything else about them now or in the future. I also ask anybody reading this to promote healing for them by respecting their privacy and defending them from any negativity or anger which should be directed towards me. I was the sole offender and the only one to blame for everything that happened. To my family, I apologize for the trauma you faced and may still feel. This is an ongoing sentence many of you serve because of me. I am so sorry to my friends who were betrayed by everything I hid from them and all the hardships I caused people who used to work with me. Bandmates, road crews, managers, attorneys, agents, label people, and more all had to suffer through many unexpected changes because of my actions. While they are dealing with the aftermath of my arrest, I responded towards many of them with a bitterness that I should have directed towards myself. 
I know that I can't undo the animosity I brought their way, but I can hope to mend what I can now as time goes on. To the people who looked up to me as an artist, I let you down in so many ways. I tried to show my best side to the public while feeding an ugly, growing monster behind closed doors. I wrote lyrics about the person I wanted to be rather than the person that I was. I was living a life that lacked empathy and viewed everything through a self-motivated lens. I cannot say for certain what life looks like going forward as so much is different now and I'm still learning. Music has and always will be a part of me and has helped me get through the darkest parts of my journey. However, this apology is not a part of promoting anything. Rumors circulate and that's something I've learned to accept, but this apology is just that, an apology to everyone around me. I've remained silent to the public since expressing my remorse at my sentencing because time seemed like the best way to promote healing. Today marks the first opportunity to freely apologize without any motivation to gain favor from the courts as I now have completed the entirety of my legal sentence, including the completion of all parole and probation requirements. Let it be clear that no amount of time served can right my wrongs. I do not feel deserving of a second chance and I'm not asking for anyone's trust. The way many people feel about me makes sense, and only time will tell if my future actions line up with my remorse, something I pray for every day. In the last five years, the ripple effect of all my actions has extended further than a written statement can address. Thus, I will continue to apologize in both words and actions moving forward. Thank you for reading. Tim. End quote. This was vastly different than the person that I had once cared for, and then learned to detest even the ground that he walked on. It was different. It seemed a little selfless. It was an admission, or at least the first admission, that he owned up for the betrayal of love and trust that he had for his family and friends. I read this, and I even had one of my co-workers read it as well and we were both taken aback by his words. Of course, knowing the person that I am, I took it with a grain of salt. But this was a different person than he was before. He waited a whole year to break his silence, and I think that was the best thing he could have done, if not completely shutting his mouth for the rest of his life. It seemed like there was some sincerity with him that I hadn't seen from him for years. I just remember how cold and calloused he looked at his arraignment hearing, how gravelly his looks were, how he looked like the shadow of the man he used to be. I couldn't see a change in him physically, but by his own admissions, he knew what he did, and I was going to hold his feet to the fire with my opinion, which is something that I wasn't alone in. It had been said that Tim was speaking with Jordan about what to do with the band from there on out. But nobody else had commented on the situation as far as Nick, Phil, and Josh were concerned. I still had the mindset of, who the fuck is this guy without the rest of the band? But I wanted him to grow as a person. But again, Tim goes completely silent. Now, one thing that I wanted to make mention of was that Tim had gotten remarried at this point. It was reported on February 10th of 2017 that he was marrying his longtime girlfriend, Amanda, not even being out of jail for a year, and he was getting married. So this twisted a thought process in my head, and I overcame some real mental gymnastics. I thought to myself, can he be trusted? Has he changed? Longtime girlfriend, is that the woman from Florida? I was confused. It did seem like he was turning over a new leaf, and maybe he did change, but I'm still taking things with a grain of salt. But from there, a lot of rumblings had come through the woodwork, not really on behalf of Tim or Jordan, let alone the rest of the band, but more of some of Tim's uh, prominent friends and musicians in the scene. Now, you see, the metal scene can be a very divisive scene. 
Taking from personal experiences with controversies surrounding bands, I know people who have been at their throats and vice versa over different topics. Whether it's someone wearing the shirt of a band that they don't know, or someone thinking that gays shouldn't be in the metal scene but they still 100% love Judas Priest, hell, even Dave Mustaine from Megadeth being a hardcore conspiracy theorist has pushed people away from music. It's almost common, and it's only intensified over time. There's even another controversy surrounding metal that actually hit really close to home. This happened back on August 4th in Dayton, when the shooter had murdered nine people in cold blood. Some fucking dildo named Jim Heath put out a tweet that said, quote, Suspect in Dayton shooting was wearing shorts with a black t-shirt that read, No heart, no fear, no soul to steal. The slogan is believed to be from a hateful and vengeful song called Ramirez by The Acacia Strain, a metalcore band, end quote. You see, people will look at someone to blame in this situation, but from my personal opinion, I absolutely jam the fuck out to the Acacia Strain on a regular basis, and their vocalist, Vincent Bennett, took to Twitter to call out this reporter. Vincent responded in a series of tweets that said, quote, What happened in Dayton is horrifying. Even more so to know that the shooter was wearing a the Acacia Strain hoodie is making me sick. There is no excuse for this. Anyone who knows anything knows that we don't condone this behavior. No one has the right to take another's life. We will be taking action to help the families of the victims however we can. Then later on the same day, Vincent put out another series of tweets that said, I'm fucking shaking. Music is an outlet. Music should purify. Use it as a positive outlet for your negative emotions. If you feel angry, turn to music. Turn to creation. This has to stop. Please be good to one another. Hold on to your loved ones and never let them go. Surround yourself with people who make you happy and strive to be the person that makes everyone smile. Vincent is one of the most genuine dudes I've ever seen and even had the pleasure to get a picture with. He's a big old teddy bear, and yeah, while the Acacia Stream has some pretty brutal music, I know that the band members are genuine, and they are all around wonderful dudes. But it's the thing that's as old as time. Blame the music, blame the artists, not the person who carried out the horrific act. Well, in Tim's case, I still think he had blame, but he almost seemed like he was turning over a new leaf and taking the blame that he rightfully had ownership of. With news circulating that Azalea dying was coming back, some people within the metal scene started taking notice of Tim and even started talking to him about what he was planning for the band and who might be involved. Then reportedly, it leaked that the band had actually formally regrouped. Many people close to Tim and the rest of the band had let it slip that they sat down, they started talking to each other over their fears, the lies, the anger, and the resentment towards Tim. There were unconfirmed announcements that they had all met up and even started working on new material. The vast majority of it went unconfirmed, however. Then, June 1st of 2018, the As A Lay Dying official Twitter page finally had a new update. It was just a 44 second long video. No lyrics. Just guitar strumming. then a lead guitar playing behind it. Then it starts picking up a little bit. And then the drums kick in. But then it ends right before a build up and you see a hand reaches for a microphone and the video cuts off completely. This sent shockwaves through the community, in both ways. Reports started coming in that there was a new song and video that was going to be released, but from the video, you could tell that it was definitely Jordan, Nick, 
Phil, and Josh who were playing the instruments. A lot of people went to each of the individual artists' page to see whose gear they would use, considering there were no faces in the video. But it was confirmed to be the four people, plus it goes without saying that the Hulk-sized hand grabbing the microphone looked to be Tim as well. The report said that a new track would be coming out on June 8th, and they were right. I remembered when I first heard this rumor, so I found an unofficial YouTube video that played the song in its entirety that was taken from a Japanese early release. And honestly, I was kind of impressed. I even sent a link to my coworker, and he, being a massive Christian metal fan, was also kind of blown away. The song was titled My Own Grave, and it garnered a shitload of attention from the band's biggest fans and Tim's harshest critics. With that being said, there is an outlet website called Metal Sucks. They spared no chance throwing Tim completely under the bus. They published a piece on June 7th called, quote, This is the final time you will read about As I Lay Dying on Metal Sucks. And they completely shredded Tim. They likened him to Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby and Donald Trump. Now, I question my own feelings about Tim and the band reuniting. I saw a lot of what they said in the article, and there were parts of me that completely agreed with them. They even put a part in the article about Tim's marriage. That was also very scathing. Metal Sucks is one of the more popular websites that people read, and they even have a podcast, and they were 100% fucking done with him. That received backlash and support from the metal community, and to this day, they still have posted zero articles about As I Lay Dying since their final piece, which is pretty noteworthy because As I Lay Dying definitely grabs some headlines to this day. Now, on June 11th of 2018, the official Twitter for the band posted, quote, It's difficult to encapsulate all the topics we want to address with a written statement. We understand there are many questions, and we plan to address them this week. End quote. Then they followed through. On June 16th of 2018, they posted a video from their YouTube channel. From left to right, you see Phil, Nick, Tim in the middle, then Josh to his right, and Jordan at the far right. The video is about a half hour long, and the look of the guys' faces was very telling. They almost looked defeated. But Tim starts talking about the process of reaching out to these guys. It touches on many subjects from Tim, to their fears of getting in touch with him, how fresh their wounds still were, the pain, the anger, their honest feelings about the ripple effect that Tim had brought on these guys. They were hurting. So sure, when I watched the video, I was taken aback due to the fact that these guys were making music again. But this was something that was much more tangible compared to that music video. There was a cloud around these guys. And this was the first time hearing their personal testimony about the man who stripped their livelihoods away from them, but he was sitting there to absorb everything they had to say. So it starts out with Tim, and then Josh talking about his reconnection with Tim, and then Jordan starts talking. But Phil's testimony was pretty heavy. He spoke about how he was relieved, not because Tim was there, but because he said that their relationship had strained in the years prior to 2013. When Tim was incarcerated, he was relieved that he didn't have to deal with Tim, deal with his manipulation, and didn't have to resent him anymore. He spoke about how Tim's presence in the media was still haunting him. Although he saw Tim's time behind bars as a peaceful moment, it was peppered with moments of hatred towards him. He spoke about his fear of what was going to happen when Tim was released, that his time of peace, his time of woven war was about to be affected. He swore to himself that he was done with As I Lay Dying. He even replied back to Tim that he was done with him and that he should stop trying to reach out to Phil. The interview between all of them pretty much solidified that the two people who were looking at Tim through a different set of lenses were Josh and Jordan. Although they were hesitant at first, 
They were the guys who were willing to give Tim a second chance that he wasn't sure that he was even worthy of. Those were the two people who approached Phil about the possibility of coming together with Tim in tow. He mentioned how he read the statement that Tim posted a year after his release. It seemed to be different to him. It seemed like it was a different person than the brother that he had grown to resent and hate. Then, Nick started talking about his transition between As I Lay Dying and starting Woven War. Nick was questioning himself. During his sentencing, after his sentencing, then touched on his reaction to the alternative press interview that came out that he hated Tim for what he said in that interview. His most outspoken critic had fully felt like the guy, the brother, and the bandmate he once had only cared about himself and he washed his hands of Tim's existence. He talked about even though he was working with Woven War, Tim was always there. People were always confronting Nick about Tim, and somehow the only identity that Nick had was the one that Tim had assigned him as the guitarist of the band whose vocalist wanted to murder his wife. Can you imagine that? You had absolutely no part in his actions or behaviors, but somehow, due to his selfishness, his lack of empathy, you are now known by his decisions. And that is what is going to follow you around. Fuck your new band, fuck your music, fuck your tour, you're now that guy. I can't even wrap my mind around how Nick felt in those years before and after Tim's sentencing. And it's really hard watching Nick's testimony. Nick is tearing up in this interview, and you can see this guy confessing his pain in front of the man who took almost everything from him. Even the emails that Tim had sent Nick, he denied him in every single chance that he could. This man is haunted by his former brother, and his life is always affected by him. He spoke about how, because of Tim, he lived in fear. He couldn't trust his friends with anything regarding him. He would grind his teeth at night, and it manifested into physical pain, and he couldn't live his life because he always had to live in Tim's shadow that was overcasting him. I genuinely feel so sorry for Nick and the pain that you can visibly see him going through in this interview, especially with the man who created this physical and mental hell for him sitting right next to him. Nick had then spoke about Tim's statement that he posted, owning all of his convictions. But at first, he didn't know what to think. He kept thinking that, as he said, quote, I don't know what to think about it, because it was the last thing I expected. I remember thinking like, okay, no, the other shoe is going to drop next week, and it never came. At that point, Phil was done with Woven War, and he hadn't talked to Nick in over a year. But a few weeks after Tim's public apology, Phil hit up Nick to talk, but Phil wanted to apologize for their strained relationship. Nick had a time of self-reflection. The mental anguish that he experienced from Tim, then punctuated by Phil's apology, is what made him finally take Tim at his word and agreed to meet up with him. With Nick being probably the closest person to Tim, he went into meeting with him with the biggest grain of salt that you could ever imagine. Bigger than those fake-ass Himalayan salt lamps that do nothing. Seriously, Google it. They're, they don't do anything. But, as Nick put it, quote, It was nothing but genuine remorse on his end, end quote. He physically observed Tim as he crushed him with his convictions, and he took every single question, statement, and feeling that Nick had, and he validated them. Tim made him feel like Nick's actions were justified, they were honest, and Tim took responsibility for everything that he had done to Nick. That's when Nick knew that the brother and friend that he had for well over a decade was still in there somewhere. Now, I'm going to play audio from that, and I'm going to let Nick say the rest of it. And I was watching, like, every question I, I had for him, I was just 
staring straight into his soul, looking for any hint of inauthenticity. Because I was just like, I know that this is a trick. And I didn't see it. And when I, when I finally like let my guard down, who was standing before me was actually someone who was genuinely contrite, like remorseful and could never take back what he did. The fact that he made victims out of really good people and all of us that were close to it were also hurt. And the people that still supported him, that still loved him, were also hurt by it. You know, seeing, seeing the, the emotional toll that it took on his, his parents who didn't deserve it, it was, I think, far more rehabilitating than actually just sitting in a, a prison cell and being gone in prison. So that's what it took. It took all of, all of those years, him facing punishment, the consequences for his actions, living, living in the ruin that he made for himself, and also acknowledging that it would never end. You know, it, what he did was very public, and it could never be forgotten, and it shouldn't. But that's part of what he has to endure for the rest of his life. But when I saw who he was, and who he had genuinely become, I let go of that. And I wanted to let go of it because I had never handled it. And I, I let that pain and that hurt and that hopelessness, I let it became, become my life force in the form of hatred. And I used that as my strength for all those years, but it devastated me on the inside. I think that what he said is pretty powerful. With Nick being his hardest critic, he has a point. Tim will live with this for the rest of his life, but he knows that. You can hear how Nick has been broken by this man, but he will learn to love him like a brother, but keep his feet to the fire. I believe that Nick saw a change, and with this man being one of the closest friends, most conflicted victims, and harshest critics, I think Nick may very well be onto something. So shortly after that interview, with all of them coming out, that's when I felt like maybe this guy has changed. Maybe he is somebody different. Maybe he can or has been rehabilitated. Hell, even the lyrics from My Own Grave was a full-on reveal that he knew what kind of monster he had become. So after that had come out, Hate Breed's vocalist Jamie Josta spoke out in a series of tweets and his own podcast about how the band Bleeding Through's vocalist Brendan Schipetti had posted a photo of he and Tim together, but then in the wake of the Me Too movement, how would that make Brendan feel considering his he has female fans and then his own keyboardist of his band is also female? Josta really wasn't playing it to Tim, and he thought that he could be manipulating him. So, in a tweet, Jamie had said, quote, Nick, Jordan, Phil, and Josh are incredible musicians and very nice people. There's a discussion to be had when the time is right. Hopefully, we'll do it, and they can give everyone insight behind their decision. Until then, I will hold judgment. But he later posted a tweet that wasn't kind of received very well, but it was justified, and it said that, quote, Think about how bad every other job must be if you're willing to go right back into a job with a guy who is going to kill his wife and mother of his kids for a thousand dollars. Open invite for all As I Lay Dying guys to come on the podcast to discuss, though. End quote. Jamie wasn't the only person to cast shade against him. One of the bands he was influenced by shared the Christian metal moniker with was the band Zayo. In an interview with their guitarist and vocalist named Scott Mellinger, Scott had discussed the As I Lay Dying's future and specifically about Tim. It's worth noting that Tim and he worked closely with Zayo and he co-produced their Awake album which released in 2009. So on the podcast, Scott had said, quote, do I think Tim Lambesis deserves to be in a band? Fuck no. That dude wouldn't be in a band if he went through with what he tried to go through with. If he ended up not talking to a cop and talking to a real dude, his wife might not be here. And it's hard for me to even rationalize or any kind of stuff. End quote. 
Now, how would that make you feel? If one of your peers and someone that you worked with, not to mention were inspired by, came out and told you that you're not worth your weight in dirt. So after they released the single, the band started, well, attempted to tour. But some of their shows were canceled in the process. Not because of schedule conflicts, but because there was a massive amount of public outcry stating that they didn't want to see the band on stage, mainly because of Tim. And I supported this. I think it was far too early for him to try to be given a stage and a fucking audience. So they were kicked off of 2019's Resurrection Fest that was scheduled for June of 2019 in Spain. Then another one was cancelled in Memphis, Tennessee due to Tim being back in the band. But it is worth noting that instead of having them play the show, the community had made plans to set up a benefit show for victims of domestic violence on that day instead. And with that, Tim had actually released a statement, and here is that. While I'm disappointed by the cancellation of our show in Memphis, I understand and accept the resentment some people have towards who I used to be. I stand against that person I became during the darkest period of my past, and it is part of my life's work to prevent others from going down the destructive paths. It's now been almost six years since I made the biggest mistake of my life, and I consider each day an opportunity to do something positive to turn my life around and to use my experience to help others. As I move forward with this purpose, I know there will be obstacles. However, I wish we could have come up with a more meaningful solution for the fans in Memphis rather than just cancel. Perhaps I could visit a recovery center in Memphis, a free event to our fans and those being served at the center where I can open up a Q&A and all questions will be welcome. I look forward to continuing this conversation around recovery, how to prevent others from ending up in a bad place, and how to facilitate healing in the lives of people who have been hurt by others. I welcome the opportunity to address the topic of domestic violence and how I am not on the opposing side of this critical issue. Since serving my time, I have been involved in the following. I completed all of the courses necessary to become an addiction treatment counselor in the state of California with hopes of bringing others who are struggling with addiction and mental health. I worked for a year as a case manager in an addiction treatment facility. I spent two years tutoring inmates who never finished high school. Education is the greatest tool we currently have for breaking the criminal cycle of repeat offenders. I currently visit prisons quarterly to help inmates without job skills train for their release so they can become productive neighbors and not a burden on society. Most end up back in prison due to lack of hope or a support system. Through As I Lay Dying, our recent tours have allowed us the opportunity to donate proceeds of the sales to organizations that help others, notably heart support and families affected by the California fires. Thanks to fans connecting with this message, we were able to become one of Heart Support's main contributors. We strongly believe in their objective to offer emotional support and counseling to young adults caught in the cycles of depression, abuse, and addiction, and will continually support charities that further the process of healing for others. By listing all of the above, it's not my intention to gain praise or recognition. I simply want to make sure it's clear how seriously I take all of these issues. Throughout my four years of incarceration and release, I've sought meaningful personal change and surrounded myself with family, friends, and counsel. I'm grateful to have earned the support of my bandmates, my wife, family, and fans who have given me this chance. I will continue to move forward in my personal mission to help others and make a positive impact in the world around me, knowing there will be challenges and believing that the next half of my life will be more meaningful than the first. I look forward to continuing a discussion around recovery, mental health, domestic violence, and prisoner reform for many years to come." End quote. Now, I am going to give you a trigger warning. This isn't gore or anything like that. 
I've discussed in this episode a lot of my own personal conflicts that I have with this man. How I'm kind of still sitting in the side that thinks that maybe the other shoe is going to drop. That's the side that's going to take him at his word and hope he proves me wrong. So with this warning, I'm telling you that I am going to be playing an audio clip from a video that Heart Support had published on May 29th of this year. If you don't want to listen to his voice, I completely understand. And post-production Hunter, how far forward should they have to skip? God, it feels like a fucking eternity since I've been on here, dipshit. So, uh, yes, this is deep. This is the voice of... A monster. A possible reformed monster. But if you want to skip his voice, I suggest that you skip forward about 2 minutes and 45 seconds. Thank you. Thanks, butthole. So yes, skip forward about 2 minutes and 45 seconds, and you don't have to listen to it. That's your choice, and I respect that. So here is Tim in his very own words. I hurt every single person in my life. People who loved me, people who cared for me, people who knew me and spent substantial parts of their lives with me. I hurt many of them to a devastating degree. At the very least, my behavior incited anger and disappointment. On the other hand, it put fear and helplessness in the hearts of people who are innocent and blameless. I went to prison on a charge of solicitation of another to commit murder. It was the end of a dark, ruinous path I chose to walk down for far too long. Putting good people through pain and misery is a monumental regret I will carry for the rest of my life. I wish every day I could take it back. Days in a prison cell are what they're supposed to be. Every silent minute defaulted to the shameful recollection of who I'd become and what I'd done. The scope of suffering I created and my inability to change it. Who and what I had lost and my inability to undo that great harm. For me, those minutes occupied hours that slowly became days for months upon months, spanning almost four years. Over those years, I began to seek hope in the mess of my shame and disgrace. I chose to believe that I could take small steps from out of the depths of my self-inflicted ruin, that the lessons I've learned from my mistakes and failures could be used to signal others away from a similar course. I have a heart for those struggling with mental health and addiction. The complexities of both plagued my past and it is my desire to help them in their journey through and out of those things. Prison granted me both time and opportunities to complete all the necessary courses to become an addiction treatment counselor. It gave me the opportunity to make a positive impact as a case manager at a recovery facility upon my release. It gave me a chance to make a difference. I resent the person I became during the darkest period of my past. A large part of my life's work now is to prevent others from going down the same destructive paths. I stand against all forms of domestic violence and any other type of behavior that creates fear or feelings of helplessness in others. I'm thankful for every new day and consider each one an opportunity to do something positive in any way I can. I accept and acknowledge that many will resent and reject me. Though I live and breathe remorse daily, it will never erase the pain I inflicted upon the world around me and within the lives of those who never deserved it. I understand the varying degrees, conditions, and time frames every individual has with regards to their capacity to forgive. I'm tremendously grateful for anyone who has accepted my efforts to make amends and ultimately given me a second chance, especially those who have known me at my worst. Now, I mentioned that that came from the foundation of Heart Support. Heart Support is a nonprofit company that is made by August Burns Red's vocalist Jake Lurz a band that is still heavily in the Christian metal scene, and they're also signed to Solid State Records. Heart Support is an online nonprofit that helps people who may be struggling with depression, addiction, suicide, or even just adversity. They published that video, and it goes on to include his bandmates and how they feel considering Tim is trying to own up to his own words. And he's trying to make an impact with not only himself, but with the community that had once embraced him. I'll make note that Jake had actually went on record with Full Metal Jackie, and he defended Tim and As I Lay Dying, stating that, quote, First of all, heart support is about acceptance and encouraging and forgiving. 
Our slogan is, it doesn't matter what color of your skin, what you believe in, who you are in love with, what's been done to you, or what you have done. We accept you and want to help you where you are. I think As I Lay Dying Story is a really beautiful one of redemption and forgiveness. It's one that I don't think a lot of people may think that forgiveness goes that far, or redemption is able at that point, or forgiveness that we can really do that. End quote. Since then, As I Lay Dying has been playing shows. They even made an entire album called Shaped by Fire, which released on September 20th of 2019 on Nuclear Blast Records. Tim had stated that the title of the album is about taking those painful moments in our lives and using them to transform. Now, I've listened to the album, and there's a lot less connotations behind religion, but the lyrical content, although loud and blaring and very heavy, there are some kind of redeeming qualities that come through, and I think it's not only one of the band's best works, but Tim's most honest work to this date. So if you're still listening to this episode, or series, I thank you for sticking through all of this with me. But I'm sure you want to know, do I think he's redeemed himself? Or do I think that Tim is even capable of redemption? But honestly, I'm torn. I see the work that he's doing and how he's putting his money where his mouth is, one foot in front of the other, and not just talking about how he wants to help people, but how he's actually partnered with a company and he's worked as an abuse counselor for some time now. I think that that is a redeeming quality. But it's not up to me. And honestly, I don't know if it's up to you. I think that Tim is going to take this to his own grave. And what he does moving forward will not only define him as a musician, but a man. He's even said that, and I don't think he could be more truthful with his words. I think the people who he hurt with his band, his family, and his friends have very well may have redeemed him. But that's well within their rights. He will always be known for the attempted murder, as well as a musician. And to some, he will be known for more of the former than the latter. That's also something that he will take to his own grave. But Megan has never publicly acknowledged him, his career, or the pain that it caused her and her children since this whole thing happened. There was the lawsuit in which I can't find anything about whether or not she won, but I believe that she deserved to win that lawsuit. But he tried to have her murdered. And I think if anyone on this not flat earth he needs to earn the respect, trust, and redemption from the most would be her. But I'm not going to say that she needs to publicly or even privately acknowledge him. That is for her and her children to decide. It's not required of her to forgive the man that she once loved, who once cared for her, who once tried to kill her and use her children as his alibi. I'm glad he's sober, and I'm glad that he's making the right changes for himself. This is a case in which I think that somebody very well was rehabilitated. But to one extent, Megan's feelings are valid, justified, and she, as well as everyone else that he hurt, is a victim. But everybody copes, grieves, and hurts in different ways, and you have no right to tell someone how they feel, what to think, or how to live. You can be supportive, you can be honest, you can be endearing, but the one thing you can't be is another person or have control over that person. Control your own destiny and control your own life and try to make a difference in this world because we would all rather be remembered for the good that we're capable of rather than our own personal downfalls and crimes against humanity. But this is where I'm going to wrap this up. I thank you for listening. And again, if you need it, or you know someone else who does, the National Domestic Violence Hotline is thehotline.org, or you can call 1-800-799-7233. Or if you are in need of immediate assistance, please call or text 911 in certain areas, because you are worth it. 
you're all worth it and no reason to stay is the best reason to go. So I'm going to watch this as it plays out. I'm going to watch what Tim does. I'm going to look at him with a magnifying glass. I hope he keeps his word. I hope he stays the person that he says to be. I don't want him to fail because he's been given a second chance that I don't even know if he deserves. But if you would like to, you can follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Murder and Such. And you can follow me on my personal accounts at Huntor27. And that's on Twitter, Instagram, the PlayStation Network, and Snapchat. But I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. I thank you guys for joining with me today. Please call a loved one, tell somebody that you care about them, and offer a shoulder to cry on or even just your ears for somebody to tell you that they're having a bad day or that they need somebody to talk to. It's the least that anybody can do. But until next time, I thank you for being here with me. My name is Hunter, and you've been listening to Murder and Such. And until next time, I will talk to you soon. Take care.